Hello, everyone, and welcome once again to the Temple Institute Parsha class. My name is Gedalia Meyer, and I'm podcasting from Malo Dumim in Israel. Like every year around this time, we sense ourselves steadily heading towards the annual holiday of Rosh Hashanah. Among many Jews, there is an annual emotional pitch in anticipation of this day. It is a strange combination of dread and joy. The dread springs from either the traditional notion of a heavenly judgment that is believed to take place on Rosh Hashanah, or from the more mundane feeling of interminably long synagogue services. The joy comes from the simple realization that this means we have made it in one way or another through another year, and we have a new year to hopefully look forward to. Of course, this year's celebrations will probably not be like any Rosh Hashanah in recent memory. Many communities around the world still do not know if service will be held in synagogues or in some virtual manner at home. It is likely that few people alive today have experienced such an uncertain buildup to Rosh Hashanah. There have been wars, there have been economic depressions, and there have been personal emergencies of all sorts. But there has rarely, if ever, been one quite like this, where we really don't know what to expect. We like to think that things just move along the way they do and have been scripted into reality in some dependable way. But then something like this comes along and we realize that in truth, there is much that has to be edited right on the spot. This week's Parsha is another double reading. The first is called Nitzavim, which means standing. The second is called Vayelech, which means and he went. These rather innocent sounding terms hide the power packed material that is contained in both of them. The first, which we shall be focusing on, deals with the classic end of the Deuteronomy subject, of the destiny of the Israelites. The second also touches on this, but it concentrates on Moshe's final days on earth and how he handed over the reins to Joshua, his successor. Both are extremely short parshas, with Vayelech being the shortest in the Torah and Nitzavim being the second shortest. For this reason, they are frequently combined into one Shabbat reading. They always come right around Rosh Hashanah. Nitzavim, the first parsha, despite its brevity, includes some of the most important ideas in the Torah. Among them are the prophetically ordained return of the Israelites to the land of Israel. While at the time it must have seemed incredible that they would return from the predicted dreadful exile, in contemporary times it is both taken for granted and seen as an outright miracle. This contradictory reaction to the end of the 2000 year exile and the rebirth of the nation of Israel has been one of the defining events of modern times. Rarely in history has such a watershed moment taken hold in the midst of politics and war and reshaped so much of the world in a manner that simply defies explanation. But such is the destiny of the Israelites. Beyond this, the Parsha veers into a somewhat strange paragraph that doesn't really seem to fit in anywhere. Here's the quote. This commandment that I am commanding you with today is not mysterious or distant from you. It is not in the heavens that you might say, who will go up for us to the heavens and take it to us, that we would hear it and do it. Nor is it across the sea that you might say, who will cross the sea for us and take it for us, that we would hear it and do it. It is very close to you in your mouth and in your heart to do it. That's the end of the paragraph. What could this possibly be referring to? Whoever would have thought that the Torah or whatever, or whatever commandment this text means here would be found in the heavens or across the sea? What could prompt such a question? The implication of the questions is that this whole thing is too difficult to understand or to do without the intervention of some divine help or some assistance from a distant land. The response to all this is that none of this is so. Rather, it is right there at your fingertips, so you don't, you don't need any outside help. But who would have thought otherwise? There is perhaps a rather straightforward answer to this question. The Torah is not at all simple. Both for its time and even for the future, it was a highly complex system of belief and law that seems to contain an almost infinite depth and endless possibilities. If anything has been shown by the subsequent development of rabbinic Judaism, it is that this depth and these possibilities were always there and would inevitably emerge. These questioning statements in this parsha towards the end of the book of Deuteronomy 
seem to be voicing this suspicion that this thing is just too complex to deal with. The metaphors of in the heavens or across the sea are there to express the apparently inaccessible nature of this system. So what is the response to this complaint? It is that the Torah is, quote, close to you, as close to you as your mouth and your heart. It is right there within you to understand everything, no matter how daunting that may seem at times. This seems to imply that even as deep a theology as monotheism, and even as complex a law system as the Torah, is already within us in some way and thus readily understandable. It also implies something else, that we are the ones responsible to delve to its depths. We cannot outsource that responsibility to others, especially if this means ditching it altogether for lack of access. There is a somewhat famous story in the Talmud that expresses this idea to some degree. It involves two rabbis, one named Eliezer and the other named Yoshua or Joshua. It seems that there was a general debate over a complex topic involving Torah law, the details of which are not important for our purposes. Rabbi Eliezer brought one proof after another to support his side of the argument. He even resorted to heavenly assistance as a backup. He called upon clear miracles happening in the natural world if he was indeed correct. All of them worked as ordered. When he convinced nobody by this unorthodox method, he then called upon heaven itself to support his position. At that point, the Talmud explicitly states, a kind of voice came out from heaven saying that the law was like Rabbi Eliezer's opinion, not only here, but in all places. At this point, Rabbi Yoshua, who witnessed this entire show, stood up and quoted one of our very verses. He said, it is not in heaven, which the Talmud interprets as meaning that we must ignore these heavenly voices and follow simple logic and majority opinions. The Talmud doesn't end at that point, but concludes with the remarkable statement that another rabbi asked the legendary Elijah the prophet what God's reaction was to all this. The response he received was that God was smiling, in a sense, and saying that his children had defeated or outsmarted him. This story is a classic in Jewish lore. There is so much one could say about it, so many angles to work with. We will focus only on the most basic point, that the Torah is not in heaven. We do not listen to outside sources, no matter how miraculous and divine they may seem. We have to be the ones who make this thing work. We cannot rely on miracles or heavenly voices or even prophets to get us through the inevitable problems. That divine assistance may spring up once every, every once in a while, and it may be great while it lasts, but it is not the bread and butter of Judaism. That is found right here in flesh and blood rabbis, teachers, and everyday people who have to struggle with life and find ways of making it work. It is not in heaven. Perhaps this is why the next paragraph in the Torah and the closing one in this Parsha goes right into the elusive subject of the freedom of the will. This is the only place in the entire Bible that explicitly deals with this great mystery of life. Since ancient times, people have wondered if we truly have free choice. In modern times, scientists have largely come to the unsettling conclusion that we don't. <clears throat> How do they explain the fundamentals fundamental experience of free will? They don't. They just say that it is an illusion. But the Torah states as clear as a bell that such is not the case. Here's the quote. See, I have placed before you today life and good, death and evil. And a few verses later, I call to testify for you the heavens and the earth, that life and death I place before you, blessing and curse, and you should choose life in order that you and your descendants live. This dramatic declaration is a fitting ending to this dramatic partial. Free will exists regardless of what philosophers or scientists may say about it in the future. It is there for us to use. It is the greatest and most powerful tool we possess, and upon it hinges everything. Only we can make these choices of life and death, of blessing, of curse, of good and evil. As, the, as biblical as all this sounds, it is just as relevant today 
as it was when stated thousands of years ago. The Torah is not in heaven. It is for us to understand and to do. We and we alone have to make those choices and what we are going to do with it and how we want to live our lives. Nobody else makes those choices for us once we attain a certain maturity in life. We cannot expect miracles or divine intervention to solve our problems. Even God apparently thinks this whole notion is ridiculous. This is our task and our fate. We have to be the ones who choose life. Could any message be more appropriate right before Rosh Hashanah? This is really what this holiday is all about. Despite the focus on honey and apples and ram's horns, those are important and they give the celebration the solemn dignity and celeb celebrative feeling that it deserves. But there is something else, something subtle and nevertheless obvious that permeates this time of year and the mood that it may bring. It is this idea that we have to call the shots in our lives and make things happen the way that we hope. Our agendas may or may not be realized by our choices, but it is nevertheless, up, nevertheless upon us to make the effort to get things started. Much of, much of what may take place this coming Rosh Hashanah will be out of our hands. There is only so much we can do about things that are beyond our control. But that does not mean that everything is out of our control. It is precisely those things that are within our control that we are responsible for, and not for all the rest. It is those things that truly are not in heaven, but right here, right here on earth in our own little hands. Shabbat Shalom.